Tom, have we decided on a title for this episode yet? Well, I, I thought Rough Diamonds. Rough Diamonds. Rough Diamonds. That, that's a clean of it. I was going with, yeah, Diamonds the Rough Drafts, which doesn't really work, <laughs> is it? But it's, yeah, or, yeah, let's go with Rough Diamonds. That's, yeah, that's what we call yeah. it. So we're here today to talk about, and I'm really excited that Tom has shared this with me because long-time listeners, viewers will know how much I love Diamonds Forever. Tom has shared with me which he's allowed to do, but we're not allowed to put them out there publicly. So we unfortunately, we won't be able to share the, the visuals of these pages with you. But he's uh, shared with me the details of some of the early drafts of Diamonds of Forever. And is it fairly safe to say, Tom, that, that they're a bit different to, to what we got in the finished film? Slightly, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, slightly different. So yeah. just before we get stuck into that, um, are you drinking anything interesting today? Uh, it is rye old fashioned, which I I think I think Bond drinks in the novel Diamonds Are Forever, but I could be wrong. I, I might get a, a Bond a Bond wrong on that on Twitter. Don't oh no! Me. Oh no! You'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> That's assuming Twitter even still exists by the time. That's that a good point. Out, but we'll see. Uh, the, I'm drinking a uh, a Japanese slipper, which has a very loose connection with Diamonds Are Forever because. Uh, we start with, and in fact, if you're watching the video version of this, you'll see I've got the opening shot of Diamonds Forever as my backdrop today. Not as stylish as Tom, who has gone <laughs> with uh, the amazing Ken Adam Blofeld penthouse set. But uh, yeah, we open in Japan, don't we, in the film of Diamonds yeah. Forever? Uh, in Pinewood, of course. But we open in Japan with Bond throwing a gentleman through a paper screen, you know. <laughs> So, and of course, there are, there are the theories which I I personally slightly subscribe to that it may have been attempted to link it to you only live twice, um, which is an interesting when you when we not to spot go too far ahead of ourselves, but when you mm-hmm. you look at how closely originally they were going to tie this to the previous film rather than yeah. it's interesting that maybe they went completely the other way and it's just a, a link to you only live twice. And that's one of the main things that we're going to pick up, one of the main kind of threads that go through these early drafts of Diamonds Forever. Before we get stuck into Diamonds Forever, um, do you just want to tell people a little about, about yourself? Sure, yes. I'm I'm Tom. Um, if you're on, on Bond Twitter, you'll probably have seen my terrible uh, attempts at comedy videos, things like generally that's why I'm, I think, tend to be most known for uh, bizarre edits. Uh, sometimes go a bit more highbrow and try and, uh, you know, recreate lost stuff like the uh i did the, the spiral of me score the other day um which i found quite interesting sort of like i i'm this it kind of ties into this i guess i'm a bit of a sucker for anything that wasn't used in final films because of course you've only like we only have like the one text of the film really to that's like what is known as the canon of the of the series but really there's so many sort of alternate universes really in directions this could have went at any point in production and it's just these certain choices were made then with the final thing that we got i always find that a bit fascinating you have to, you're far too modest some of your creations <laughs> are like artworks in their own so i remember we, i was privileged enough to watch your version of diamonds of forever a private mm-hmm. screening online where you inserted selected deleted scenes <laughs> so made corrections like the famous flip that you could yes, that flip was... the footage around. So <laughs> the car going through the alleyway, why did no one think to just flip the fish footage? Yeah, that one, honestly, it's, it's... it's... What you did in your version, and it totally worked. And, yeah, and talking about deleted scenes, I just remember the... Because we were a lot... There were about a dozen of us or 20 of us watching mm-hmm. along, weren't there? And that was the first time many people had seen the deleted scene where we see <laughs> Sean Connery's backside. <laughs> <laughs> on the on the glass fish bed, and people were like, what? And I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> Yep, that, that, that was particular the, scene. We almost it? got Bond's bottom in the <laughs> Bond film, which would have been a first, which they've never, they haven't yet done. So maybe <laughs> something for Bond twenty six. So um, you you actually get to study James Bond for a living, don't you? Um, That's a partly, simplification. Yes, my my day job at the moment is quite diff. Well, as in the research, the main research is. Uh, surrealism and Hollywood musicals which is mm. quite substantially different to James Bond but uh, obviously I've, I've been a fan of Bond for like more than 20 years now so any attempt I can get to try and do a bit of research um, related to Bond is always a bit of a, a treat. Um, this started actually 
as something I was just doing in my spare time. But the more I've found out about it, I'm tempted to sort of. The current plan is to make it into an article um, about the development of Blofeld through the series, specifically um, the Blofeld we don't see. So, of course, there's this, which is, as we'll get into, a totally different um, incarnation than we got in the final film, but also things like The Spy Who Loved Me, um, which again, I think I mentioned on, on Twitter the other day, if you, um, if anyone listening had, had seen that way, um, right until very late in production, um, there was still very slight references to uh, Stromberg being Blofeld, basically. Well, not, didn't call him Blofeld, but he was like basically Blofeld by any other name. And I mean, to be honest, there's, there's people been batting around, um, you know, your opinion as to how close the, that film relates, relates to uh, you know, twice and that sort of thing. Um, things that had only kind of increased my suspicion that it was uh, basically, basically it's a Blofeld film by any other name. Um, so that that's sort of where I'm, Hoping to take this overall research is looking uh, maybe even if Eon are kind of, which I, I do, I'm not sure. They might let me look at, uh, at Spectre and all that stuff's being released, but I'd love to see that and see how Blofeld developed there. Because I know from some of the leaks, there was a, a, again, a totally different version of Blofeld that we got in the final film. So, how does it work getting access to this material from Eon? Basically, um, you have to ask <laughs> and you have to, uh, you have to. To uh, Klaus Hergesheim and state your credentials, basically, and just say I'm, uh, I'm, I'm researching X, Y, Z, and then if they if they're fine with it, they will send you an email saying, okay, we're fine with that. But you then have to take to, in this case, uh, it's the University of Iowa who store this stuff. Right. Um, this it's just it's stuff all over the place. I mean, that's, that's why I'm with with the other things I'm looking at. I'm I'm going to have possibly have to get on Ian themselves because. I'm, I'm surprised that Ian, like, is put no Eon Productions, um, because this stuff's everywhere. It's all over the place. Like, it's often in in archives of whatever, you know. In this case, which are Maybaum, we were talking about. May, Maybaum, we'll go with Maybaum. Um, I'm hoping it's Maybaum because that's what I've always said on podcasts. Yeah. If it's Maybaum, I've been saying it wrong all these years. <laughs> I think I'll bow to your better uh, cunning linguist knowledge. <laughs> you got that one right. <laughs> Very good. So the the all everything we're talking about was from this University of Iowa store of uh, Richard M- Maybaum's papers. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, it's it's good. yeah. Uh, things. I mean, there was there's a lot more in the particular folder than this. Yeah, like this is part of a, a big backlog of treatments that he did, and um, that's the one thing about these that these never got as far as a script stage. Sadly, um, was only treatments which if you don't know what treatment is it's basically a prose long form version of the overall script often with bits of dialogue thrown in but not like it's not it's not formatted like a script it's more formatted like a short story but um often just you know run on sensors that sort of thing it's very it's very loose um so we don't really have like a full picture i guess of what this would look mm-hmm. like but you can sort of with with what we have we've got like what like 40 pages of over different treatments you can you can get a good idea of what um of what this might look like. Yeah, so some of the treatments were actually quite detailed, weren't they? Although what I did notice is that um, he probably gets kind of less interested as he goes on. It's almost I mean, like he just has to finish the damn thing, <laughs> which feels a bit like Diamonds Are Forever as well. So mm-hmm. it's like the oil rig scene. There's a point in the oil rig scene where you just think, right, let's just sit back. There's no tension. We're just gonna, <laughs> we're just gonna, we're just gonna like saunter to the end of the film. The 007 themes blaring on the soundtrack, and that's how some of these treatments felt to me as I was reading them i think my my favorite like little i guess almost well it's not, not to cubby probably not not to self but like where he just straight up says i don't know how this scene's going to be resolved and that is that is the the ballsy action of a man who's been working on these things for like almost a decade at this point and knows he's not going to get fired mm. he just he's like no i'm just just i don't know how this is going to work you know like but we'll, we'll worry about that and you'll fix it in post in this case post is is this well literally on filming i guess because again uh, the whole the, the actual diamonds production is such an absolute minefield <laughs> even beyond this like with oh, the change at the last moment oh really i mean i even while they were filming weren't they still planning to do the salt mine sequence or is yeah, that, that got cut yeah. really late in the day um, so the original ending for those who find yeah. the ending of diamonds forever something of a, a damp squib it was supposed to be an action sequence where blowfeld escapes in the batho sub and then there's a chase <laughs> through a salt mine and he ends up being mulched in a machine yeah. That's I, I I knew that bit already, but it was really 
interesting to actually see written on the on the page um describe that scene described in quite some detail uh I, i'm kind of pleased we were spared charles gray blofeld being uh because it's, it's, it's got to be up there with i guess maybe like elliot carver and dr kananga yeah. probably would have been one of the most graphic deaths of a bond villain and you think of, of, of all of them charles gray really you know like it just yeah. doesn't fit at all so let's get stuck into the treatments. What we've decided to do is not go treatment by treatment. We're talking, though, about essentially three main treatments. Mm. And also, I think we should talk about, um, even if just briefly, some of the notes that Maybaum gave on the Tom Mankiewicz script. So um, if you're not familiar with the production history of uh, the genesis of the story of Diamonds of Forever, Am I right in saying this was definitely, even if it was, it was the first credited one that Tom Mankiewicz worked on. He yes. hadn't worked on any previous ones. No, he hadn't. And then he, um, he did sort of credited and uncredited work. I think, again, people may correct me. I think until Moonraker, that was, I think it was credited on this and possibly Live and Let Die. And then I think it was uncredited for the, the rest of them. But I could well be wrong there. I'm not an expert on, on his. So, Richard Maybaum had been working on the Bond film since Dr. No. Mm. Um, and then he actually, his last contribution was Licence to Kill, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like, I think the guy was like in his 80s by then as well. He worked on it really late and it was, um, and it was like, I mean, he died between um, Licence to Kill and Goldeneye. So whether he would have worked on Goldeneye if he'd still been alive, I, I it's unknown. I don't know whether, you know, it's, it was kind of a, a script change that was forcing them, I guess, but. It's interesting. So, I, think, really I think we'll just do this as a disclaimer now. We're going to find some of his decisions quite questionable, <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly, um, as we go. But we, we it comes from a place of love because this guy obviously <laughs> made a massive contribution to the Bond series over the years. Um, I'm, I am quite glad that Tom Mankiewicz ended up on Diamonds of Forever because, as I say, I love the tone of that film. And it's fair to say that they had very different approaches. So we'll get stuck into that as well. I think probably the best way to summarise this is um, you sent me a you sent me a message um, a few days ago um, after I'd had a read of these treatments and I'd sent you my notes and my reactions to them. And you said to me, Notwithstanding Maybaum's obvious sexism, racism, and homophobia, <laughs> reading his stuff is about 50% ahead of his time. And a lot of Diamonds of Forever treatment stuff feels like it could be in a Craig film. And 50% absolutely deranged. So <laughs> I think that that really summarizes it for me because there are some things in here you go, what oh, yeah. and and it, I, I imagine listeners are going to have a similar reaction to, to me as I was reading them I was messaging you as I was reading them and I was like I, I was running out of shocked face emojis <laughs> at some of the things that were coming up in these treatments so we're going to talk but had there, but you're absolutely right there's loads of stuff here mm. that actually ends up getting recycled later in the series yeah. i mean that we all know this about the bond series ideas ne you know even if it takes 30 40 years they never forget about things that were were moved and perhaps some of the more bizarre things in here this may eventually end up in the bond films we'll see how it goes so we're going to talk about those the ideas that get recycled in the later films and then also we're going to talk about how more elements from the Fleming novels found what could have found their way into Diamonds of Forever. Um, and not just the novel of Diamonds of Forever, which is not really the story of the film Diamonds of Forever, but also the story of You Only Live Twice from Fleming. And also uh, there's a lot more in these treatments that tr basically may, if Maybaum had had his way, this would have been much more of, uh, this is my reading of it anyway, Tom, you may disagree. It would have been much more of a, a direct continuation of On a Majesty's Secret Service. Hundred percent. I mean, I think if this had been produced, it would have been the first direct sequel. You know, mm -hmm. decades before Quantum of Solace came along. Because of course, I mean, the Connery era he had sort of he had loose threads of other films being mentioned. You know, and that sort of thing in dialogue briefly, like uh, and there's that that one deleted reference in the Thunderbolt script that I think Anna put on Twitter, which I really love, where. Uh, in even as late as in the shooting script must have been changed in in post. Uh, Blofeld mentions uh, Rosa Kleb in the Spectre meeting scene that gets changed to uh, Jacques Bouvard in the actual yeah. film. But even even then, you know there were there was this 
kind of this thread, loose continuity thread through the Connery films, but this was kind of like the first direct, like proper direct sequel, even more so than, you know, Doctor No and From Shuth Love, where, you know, the Spectre plot is in response to Bond's actions. No, I know this is a full on emotional sequel with reoccurring characters and all sorts of things like that. Yeah. And I think one thing that all three of the Maybaum treatments have in common is Bond really reeling from the death of Tracy at the beginning, which uh, she, yeah. doesn't, she doesn't even get a direct mention in the finished film. And I know a lot of people have an issue with that. I've got to be honest, I always assumed the objection to that was more because we have a, a, a more modern sensibilities to kind of want continuity, but actually Maybaum definitely, certainly he wanted that as well. Whereas they kind of brushed Tracy under the carpet in a way, whereas uh, in the um, in the first treatment, Bond's living on a desolate moor, so which is kind of a reflection of his inner psychology. And he's even we're even told he's been to a psychiatrist in the third treatment, which is very much reminded me of the novel of You Only Live Twice. Yes, yeah. Um, the, the that's one of the things where I was saying about sort of almost like a like a Craig film. I, I got sort of I get big. Um, sort of Vesper vibes mm -hmm. with this, with how how um how much her death sort of played on Craig's Bond's psyche through those films. Yeah. And it's 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 funny, like you're saying, to see this decades. I mean, I wasn't expecting this when I saw it. It's just to me it's the sort of thing where again you think it's quite a modern sensibility. Like that's what yeah. you would you would think it's more of a modern idea. But yeah, it it opens with him on on a desert moor, possibly Scotland or Suffolk, uh may no one suggests, but um, I know you said that that reminds you of Skyfall a bit. It's interesting. Yeah, I couldn't resist really. I mean, yeah. I know the final act of Skyfall was was actually only the the whole going back to his childhood home was a very last minute addition in the screenwriting process. But it, I wonder if they kind of remembered this. If one of the if, if they remembered that Bond on a moor, or it might just be a coincidence. But for me, it did re you know he's walking a dog. He's living. He's described as living like a hermit. He has a framed photo of Tracy in his mm -hmm. house. We even get the first treatment says we have a, we have all the time in the world reprising on the soundtrack. Yeah, he specifically. I think he says a a melancholic instrumental, which again makes me think of No Time to Die in the way they yeah. used it in in that. Um, another idea that got recycled years down the line, but it's interesting that that's how that's a sort of fine grained continuity. He was, he was, he was like, you know, he, we're even going to reuse the music, you know, like that was like, which is never really that was so sort of, until again, until the Craig era never really happened outside of you know, John Barry action motives, that sort of thing. But you know, an actual film's theme like that, that, that was very in interesting. I mean, I suppose nice you're discounting Sheriff Sheriff Pepper in um, Man with the Golden Gun, but quite a different uh, tone with that one. Very much so. And then also in the pre-title sequence of the first two treatments, there's an attack by Irma um, Bunt. Mm. So again, a direct link with Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Mm. And I know that Raymond Benson had Irma Bunt return in one of his short stories as well. Um, the In the first treatment, and obviously from a queer point of view, this piqued my interest, Bunt is disguised as a man. Mm. So, you know, we have lots of characters in uh, in Fleming um, you, uh, wearing the uh, another gender's um, clothing, and Fleming plays with that quite a lot, even with the, the attractive girls, who gives them masculine qualities, and that's in Casino Royale, Vespa's clothes, and that sort of thing. But Bunt is very easy, disguised as a man, um, very very much so. Um, and, uh, and then... Him defeating her sets the whole plot mm. in in because uh, she, she's got some diamonds on a person. So that's kind of quite a loose connection to the rest of the story. He seemed to just want to bring Emma Bump back. Mm. <laughs> yeah, she's in the um in the third treatment as well. So it's, it's, she's in all three, and one of the one of the the re recurring elements that he keeps in, and um she's disguised as a man in the, in the third treatment. The difference um. You get is the first two, as you say, are on a Scottish moor. The third one is the chase through the London Underground. Um, mm. Again, it kind of makes me think of Skyfall, as you mentioned, but also uh, again thinking of recycling ideas like the uh, the underground chase they had to cut from Majesty's very late on. Um, 
makes you wonder whether he's thinking about reusing that idea already, like in the next film. Because it isn't it actually it. the post office train? Yeah, I've, it, well, I've never been on. I know you can visit in London, but it's the post office train, isn't it? There's the, yeah, the, the yeah. chase happens. But yeah, similar similar kind of energy to the underground train in Skyfall. Mm. Very much. I did. I didn't know that the chase in uh, Honor Majesty's. Um, I knew I'd seen the photos from the rooftop chase, but I didn't know that was originally supposed to be in Majesty's as well. Really interesting. Yeah, um, it's interesting actually with all three of them. I mean, the the actual pre tales we get for Majesty's. I go obviously we have the 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 fist fight, but it's quite subdued um, as far as pre tale sequences go. And in this treatment, we have the the chase through the underground, which is obviously a high, you know, concept action piece. And also in the in the first treatment, at least there is a a long chase sequence with. Emma Bunt in a Land Rover and Bond on a motorbike, which again makes me think of No Time to Die a bit. Uh, so of Land yeah. Rovers and motorbikes in the in the forest and on the yeah. motor, which would have probably been a very interesting action piece again. And it's when she crashes mm, yeah. the the Land Rover that's when he discovers that she's actually it's, it's Emma Bunt disguised as a man. Um, yeah. Another I mean, thing that I thought was really interesting about the openings of these stories is that Bond is very much um, depressed. And uh, the third treatment has a girl breaking into his house, a girl called Sandra, which, yeah. uh, and this is nothing against people called Sandra, but I, I just struck, because we've never seen that name in a Bond story <laughs> before, I was like, San why did he go for Sandra? <laughs> it, just, it just struck me as a little bit odd. Um, but there's also a suggestion, and maybe I'm reading a bit too much through, through the lines here, but I don't think I am, because it's there in the first treatment as well. Bond Bond seems to be, um, there's lots of hints that he's impotent, mm -hmm. that he's not interested in sex anymore. He doesn't even flirt with Money Penny in the first treatment, uh, which is, uh, but then he does then sleep with Tiffany like a few pages later. So there's a bit of, it's not necessarily consistent, but then again, it's kind of hinted that he's doing so to kind of further the mission. Mm -hmm. Whereas, yeah, there's definitely a kind of hint in the third treatment when Sandra breaks in that he's he's not able to perform as he usually does which I think would have been interesting to see in a Bond story definitely I mean I think it would have been interesting um I mean I'll see this since I've kind of going to mention it now um I can only assume this was written for George Lazenby um mm. because of when it was done in the production cycle I mean obviously the fact that Emma Bunce in it suggests that's before Ilsha Stepard's death. Um, so she was presumably going to be reprising the roles. Yeah. Um, there's only one of them, one of the treatments has a day on it, and it's October 69, so it's a few months before the film, uh, on the Manchester Secret Service premiered. So the assumption is that this would George Days to be, but I would, to be honest, either if, it, if this had even been Connery coming back, it would have been interesting to see either of those bonds, I think, dealing with impotence and just they're both, they're both yeah. so virile. They're both so, so like, you know, to me, maybe other than, Roger, I guess, like to me, that like like really up. The, you know, if I was making a sliding scale, I'd have sort of Daniel Craig and Dalton maybe at one end of the scale, but then like Conway and Lazenby on the other end, where you know the sleep with pretty much every woman they see. There's that whole subplot of magic where he gets he gets rumbled because he's sleeping with so many women. So to have the other side of it, where you just yeah. to remove that aspect of his character, I think would have been really just so interesting. To be honest, with with, with whatever actor was in the role, I think. I think the only time we really ever get a hint of that is in Skyfall and it's sublimated into him not being able to fire a gun much. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, uh, so after, he, he is shown in bed with a woman looking not exactly ecstatic and then he has to go out and... Um, uh, and is, is it, does he sleep with the woman and then go out to the bar to live dangerously with a scorpion and try to drink a shot with a scorpion yeah. on his hand? I think I've got those the right way around. So it did sort of come in in Skyfall, but not as explicitly as it is in these treatments here. There is so much Skyfall stuff in here, really, where yeah. Bond like um, loses it, really, in, in some ways. And we don't get that in Diamonds at all. There's not even really much of a hint of animosity between him and Blofeld, considering what happened in the previous film. I know that annoys people, but mm. I, I'm okay with it. The, the only actually since since we're mentioning that, and I will say there's an interesting thing I found in one of the much later drafts. One of the I think it's the Mabel Mankiewicz draft because uh, I know we talked a bit about sort of how this the film developed, but there was a, a 
a period where they were they collaborated on on a draft and mm. you get a lot of weird to- totally jarring things because you know that as we said that they approach the film very differently but um one of the, the it must be one of the, the last vestiges and i guess it was probably for maybam rather than magnavix with how magnavix end up going uh when bond uh confronts blofeld in his penthouse in vegas as he's leaving, as he's going to the when you know they have the whole spiel, and that's all word for word what's in the film. You know, it's, it's late, I'm tired, so much left to do. As Bond's turn and leave, he says, "You still owe me a life," and that's the only reference you get in the entire thing to. Oh wow! Tracy. She doesn't say Tracy. She's not mentioned at any other point, but you can only assume that that's what that's yeah referring to. And so even which late as then, which was obviously when we assumed Connery was on board because it was obviously a late script. Because they say most of it is still. Beat for beat, word for word, what's in the in the final film? Oh wow! Um, yeah, it was so there, there was there were thinking obviously thinking of it still at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Just before we get stuck into the main meat, the opening I must note in the the treatments in the alter of the treatments, the opening sequence is very detailed in the description, um, and then <laughs> I think perhaps he'd kind of had enough by that point. In the third treatment, um, Maybaum writes about the uh, the title sequence. Mor- uh, Morris Binder have a ball <laughs> it's just like <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm I not going to suggest any kind of real imagery here just <laughs> just just go for it um, which I thought was Don quite Barry with another hit <laughs> has another hit diamonds are forever and yeah so yeah. it's just like pass over to those guys the music and the <laughs> and the um, Mor- Morris Binder will, will sort the rest and mm. um, the main action the locations were really quite different in mm. some of the treatments so we actually get a sequence in Barcelona which is mm. one of my all-time I want to see Bond their locations and there's a chase through Park Guell which would mm. be really interesting um the, but um the second treatment moves most of the action to Bangkok <laughs> yeah which is uh, obviously, you know, obviously does appear in Man with the Golden Gun. So I wonder if that's where some of that work went. I I would suspect. I mean, this is sort of like back of my mind stuff, but I, I I'm sure I've come across a mention somewhere of uh Cubby Broccoli really wanting a film set in the far east. Okay. And maybe he was pushing it in this because there's an interesting little note in one of these treatments where Mankowitz has him in brackets just straight up says, I don't know much about the Far East. So I can't make, uh, you know, the background of this as detailed as I would like it to be. Um, even though, he, as you mentioned in your notes, he puts in so many like little, like almost Fleming esque bits where he's clearly researched something. He's read this in a book or a magazine somewhere. And he goes on like a paragraph explanation of why you know they use umbrellas in Thailand. That's yeah, parasols. parasols. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, so there is that. You know, he did clearly do some work, but um, makes me wonder whether that came from from Cubby, and then they didn't do it in this film, so they end up doing it, you know, a couple of years later in in Man of the Golden Gun. It is a bit Fleming like in the sense that he does almost put his research into the treatment as well. So you're right. And I think that was probably for everyone else on the production to kind of, uh, you know, or he just he just done that research. He thought, right, I need to leave it somewhere. I'll leave it in this <laughs> this story treatment here. And um, I think there are some details which, you know, we could go into all of this, but um, uh, but uh, there are some details from the Diamonds Forever novel, like Rufus B. Say actually mm-hmm. running a diamond shop, which is definitely in the uh, which is in the book. Yeah. Um, and that kind of thing. Were there any particular details from the books which you were thinking, oh, that's interesting to see this crop this crop up? Well, yeah, yeah. As, as you say, Rufus B. Say he's he's an actual person in this. He's not a he's, mm. he's a Jack Spang um, alias in the novel, mm. and he's an actual character. And he's a, he's a Spectre agent, and he reappears sort of um, later on at this big Spectre meeting. Well, big Spectre meeting. It's like six guys. It's interesting, sort of how, how Spectre diminishes, sort of film on film. Um, I know people almost say like uh, with diamonds, it's like it's just Blofeld now, and that's it. Well, he's got lots of goons, but it's basically just him. You know, you yeah. go from 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 lots of big bombings all the way through. But the um, interestingly, I would say one thing about the novel, which is almost a, a reversal, is that we have nothing in Vegas in these treatments. No, which you're absolutely does right. Yeah. Happen in the final film, they go almost go back to the Fleming novel in a way with. Uh, mm. The Vegas setting, which is just never appears at any point in any of these. No, um, you're right. Treatments. Um, but we get we get a lot of stuff in in London as well, which again is it's a diff, it's a deviation from the north. But I I really liked um, 
because I know I think it's is it Calvin Dyson's mentioned that the reason he uh, is mourns the loss of that the Majesty's train scene is we don't get enough of Bond in sixties London. We don't really get any of Bond in so if you think about it. And this whole protracted sequences here, even at Bond's home, um, we get when he's when Tiffany's uh, there sitting with him, we get an attack from some some goons at his home, which I find really interesting. Um, it's described as like a a muse house in Chelsea rather than the um the 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 Fleming flat. Maybe we think of uh, Steed's house in mm. the Avengers. You know, obviously that was very trendy at the time. Whether yeah, yeah they've been the drawing on that sort of uh, that sort of imagery, but um, the idea of him being attacked in his his house or where it's the safest again. That's something where that's a theme you get in Skyfall again yeah. of the attack on on MI six again with and I suppose the world is not enough as well. That's sort of a a purpose and weird um favorite of an attack where you feel you're the most safe. And I guess we we get on this, but that kind of happens again in these drafts uh, in relation to the MI6 staff, specifically M, um, with something that comes up later Yeah, on. so uh, we can jump around and bring yeah. on the story elements. I mean, yeah, so M, uh, well, Miss Moneypenny goes on a mission in the third mm. treatment. Uh, M sends her. Uh, there's a bit of a weird one with um, Moneypenny suddenly prudish around some erotic carvings. <laughs> and I'm just like... Um, really? Money yeah. Penny, prudish? I don't think so. Probably the least <laughs> prudish person. But then what you were alluding to, well, is not enough. In the third treatment, Emmy's actually held hostage by Blofeld and held in a hippie colony. <laughs> 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 I'm just like, okay. Um, yeah, this, that was one of the deranged bits. I yeah, was like, you started uh, getting into the deranged bit. You could almost imagine M kind of walking out after being held there for a few days and he's being turned into a hippie. She's <laughs> like, the fate worse than death for the character of M. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but we get we as we get M in the field, we get Q in the field as well. Um in a I guess years before uh license to kill. Um, but this time he's actually sanctioned. There's a weird bit in in the first two treatments where Bond actually tricks Q. Because uh, Q's the one who takes us the diamonds he gets from Emma Bunn, he, uh, they take to get verified and see where they come from. Which, again, when you're talking about um, recurring plot elements, made me think of Dine of the Day because this yes. that whole thing of, uh, which I suppose you could argue was was riffing on the original Diamonds of Rare film anyway, but yeah, uh, it's it's what I sort of got the vibe from this new mine that's popped up and no one knows where they come from. It's very much a Dine of the Day plot point. But they take these, these diamonds and Q's the one who. Uh, is carrying the briefcase and my bum says uh bond's carrying an identical briefcase because of course uh with his papers in and bond swaps the briefcase with Hugh's briefcase uh and steals the diamonds from him. and it's that felt a bit weird to have the idea of bond so like hoodwinking desmond the world not sure how that seems strange no. to me i don't know like I, maybe it's just with with you know 40 years hindsight where i'm like i'm used to this character and how he ended up going i suppose at the time he wasn't he only been in the you know as Q for you know what like five six years since yeah. then he was he's known as Q seven years, so maybe people didn't have the attachment to it then. But to me that the Bond Q is like Desmond Well and Q is the, the one character I think Bond shouldn't be you know yeah double crossing. it feels weird it's like mean. his granddad you know it's like it's it, it just felt odd, um but yeah there's there's a lot more that's why I was saying another you know, web saying about like a Craigie film. Um, it, it's almost kind of felt like Spectre at some points with all of the MI6 yeah, people having so. to do out in the field, you know, it was, it was more active. Than... We even get 006 and 008 joining the attack from the second treatment on the in the final sequence because M thinks Bond has completely lost it. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's, he's actually gone mad. And um, and that is in the second treatment and the third treatment very much. And then, uh, but then uh, 008 and 009, sorry, 006 and 008 um, join the attack when they realise that Bond is, Bond is telling the truth and he's, he's really not. Um, so that element of quantum of solace where Daniel Craig M does think that uh, Bond is, a, a, has, um, is so grief stricken and so full of rage. We get that here. It also reminds me a little bit of uh, License to Kill, mm -hmm. where we have Bond, um, as, you know, resigning and then being shot at by the uh, the agents, the bodyguards, presumably in Hemingway's house. Um, yeah, so so many bits that end up getting recycled later down the line. 
that's yeah the uh, that's that's exactly the same um note I made on that because that's again another sort of perverse and weird trope I suppose of Bond going rogue mm -hmm. um which basically happens in every one of their films and it's really interesting the idea we may have seen other double O's on screen yeah. in an active role obviously like you know again decades before Goldeneye um because yeah. we, we but even even now I would say we never we've never had that in a film it's one element I think which has still been untouched is Bond teaming up with another double O because the I, I, the only one we've seen in an, as I say in an active role is other than you know the ones that get killed here and there off you know where Bond's not involved but the only one he's been personally involved with this is unless I'm forgetting something really obvious is is Goldeneye right and yeah um, it seems like such an obvious idea you know to yeah. have you know Bond's you know even like maybe like the the, the Bond girl or something or even like an, an ally be another double O and they've never really touched that. Um, but he you know, was was obviously an idea floating around my heads as early as 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 this, as early as sixty nine. Um, mm -hmm. to have double six and double eight come in and yeah. go uh, and as you say, first try and capture Bond and then team up with him and uh, yeah. in the final assault. I think it's worth noting as well while we're on returning characters that we do get Mark Gunn's Draco come back into this story, so very much forming forging that link with Honor Majesty's Secret Service, even. Che Che, the uh, one of his um, lieutenants, I suppose. Yeah. So, anything else from kind of a, a continuity point that you thought was interesting? I mean, it's it's um it's all of them actually. We're in the in the yeah. I mean, Drake was in all three treatments. So he was like a, obviously was something that May Bam thought was a, a key continuity element to bring through. But it was it's Toussaint, Che Che, and Raphael. So it's all of his all of his gang, um, which who've been. Basically, the idea is that Draco is now retired from the Corsican mafia and he's living in an estate. And those three are working as his butlers and valets and that sort of thing. And they're sick of uh, civilian life. And that's why when Bond reappears, they're all eager to help him. And I think there's a bit where they drive like a tractor or something to stop a, uh, the car chasing yeah, Bond. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's with, with Draco um he appears sort of as almost like a reveal in the first two drafts he pops up sort of i think what would be at the end of the first act really yeah, um yeah. and in the third one he's just randomly on the phone to bond and the pre-titles the, there was no sort of pretense of, of him showing up like as a surprise um because i think it's almost even i could be misremembering um some of the finer points but i think even in the first treatment there might even be like a like an oh who is this? Because I think he sort of he's on it's his bonds on the phone to somebody um, when he's arranging this sort of hit I guess on the on the Spectre agents chasing him and and uh, I was gonna say I was gonna say Tracy um, Tiffany <laughs> and he he's on the phone to someone you don't know who it is and then it's revealed when they eventually end up at the house that it's Draco. Um, but it, again, it feels so modern. That feels like a, you know, like yeah. the sort of thing you do in a modern film. Where it's mm -hmm. like, oh, it's this returning character. Oh my god! Mm -hmm. Which just people just don't think films then cared about. But clearly, no. clearly, the people working on them had these ideas. It just yeah. didn't end up being being produced. Um, and he he survives the first two, but spoilers, he gets killed in the third one in the elephant stampede. <laughs> Which yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So that range, was part, that was part. Part. <laughs> that was like when I read the elephant stampede sequence, I was like. Yeah, there's a reason that didn't make its way in. You know, how do you shoot a herd of stampeding elephants realistically? Probably probably not practical, but you could see that he'd researched, oh, they have an elephant roundup festival. Let's turn that into a set piece, which is still what, you know, Quantum of Solace, you've got that horse race. They take yeah. cultural events, don't they? And you've got Day of the Dead, in Inspector. Mm. So uh, we may have an elephant stampede in a future Bond movie, <laughs> an elephant festival kind of thing. Um. I suppose um, in terms of new characters, we get Wint and Kid who are, and I'm going to be careful not to say the word because it's so offensive and this episode will get flagged. Um, so, uh, but yes, they're described throughout the screen treatments from the first treatment, just two American FAGSs. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, no pulling our punches there. Uh, using um, a word which was a slur back then and has uh, has become uh, far more um, taboo since uh, then. But Winter Kid are in here. Um, not a million miles away from the Winter Kid that we end up with in the film, do you think? I would say largely. Um, 
appearance wise, they are described as much closer to the ones in the novel. Yeah. One of them is sort of um heavier and one's very thin. Um which I suppose you get to an extent with Putter Smith and um yeah. one's, we... one's described as being like Terence Stamp. Yeah, young Terence Stamp yeah. which I, um, is an interesting description. So I mean like the the thing that got me is there's much less affection. I mean, obviously it's a treatment and, and like I say, they don't mm. go into deep dialogue and that sort of thing. But there's one, I think this it's in the third treatment where um they mention I think it's Kid, because I'm trying to remember, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's a reference to the Fleming novel. Kid is uh, afraid of flying and wind comforts yeah, yeah. him. That's yeah, the yeah. only hint of affection I got between the two of them um, yeah. and all the treatments. And since you mentioned at the start, I will, I'll bring this in now, that the, when May, when um, Tom Mankiewicz wrote the full script, that's when all of this sort of Wind and Kid as a couple stuff came in. And he, he developed them Really, really. I mean, it, I, I've, I've, I mentioned um, when we were talking about this a bit on, uh, on Twitter. Like, I, I actually preferred some of the stuff in the drafts what we got on screen because it's just yeah. it was really, it was really well done. But um, he had them holding hands, leaving every scene, and <laughs> maybe I'm put a note on the script saying, do they hold hands leaving every scene with like underline like they can they go you know it, it was like the idea of them holding hands and every really must they all the time. It's like well. It would have been interesting, though, to think how Maybaum would have wanted to convey that they were gay, mm. because there's not much written in the treatments about, you know, effeminate mannerisms and all no. that sort of spraying perfume, which I don't think comes into any of these treatments. So no, that no, that's no. a really important plot device. The you know, that's what eventually tips Bond off in the uh, in in the in the finished film. So there's none of that, none of that. So it's like, how would they have? I mean. The thing is, people forget this. In the Diamonds of Forever novel, they're not actually technically gay. Mm. They are um, assumed to be gay be um, because a lot Felix Leiter has drawn that conclusion. Um, and Felix Leiter probably has a better gay dar than most people. Uh, <laughs> but that's a that's a discussion for another time. Uh, but um, he's he's yeah. There's there's whereas. I would do wonder how he would have thought about conveying that on screen without yeah. It's interesting. I mean, part of me, I don't want to, I feel kind of bad, you know, like ragging on the guy. Um, but because obviously he's been dead for mm -hmm. decades, but it's just the vibe I get reading his stuff. Mm. I feel either he would have not acknowledged it at all and just sort of been like one of those things, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, kind of like right, the okay. novel, or he'd straight up have just used the slur, had somebody maybe. Oh, okay. That's wow. just the fact because he, he, he uses that word so, and I know he's from a, a different time but as you say it was still offensive then and and he uses it so freely in right the, okay and when you when you read some of his other stuff he's so like it's it's you know i'm no stranger like i said i do a lot of my work of, of you know in the 30s 40s i'm no stranger to attitudes then but even yeah. i'm a bit so taken about how freely the guy uses uh as i say <laughs> homophobia and racism in certain mm. terms now that mm. just think oh my god but you know and, and it's it's like there's other ways he could, you know, describe these people, but you all in usually you'll go the shorthand, and it's just it's. Mm, I'm quite, almost kind of glad we were spared that yeah. version of Winton Kid because I feel that you know obviously mileage may vary. Some people I know like you, you've talked about this before with in 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 depth, but some people people have different views on whether the Winton Kid we get in the final film is a good portrayal of a gay couple or not. I feel the Maypam one almost certainly. Wouldn't have been again. Right. That's my. Okay. That's just my reading of it. Mm. So I'm kind of pleased that we were spared that one. Mm. Um, don't think that would have aged the film particularly well. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, mm. And there are some more elements that we might term problematic. Um, there's a <laughs> <laughs> the whole, especially the 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 impotence thing. He's very much there in the third treatment um, over the first two. There's a line, and again, I'm going to choose my words carefully here, but um, no woman can. Um, uh, what, what you do to a light bulb to get it into the socket. No woman can, uh, we'll begin with an S, no woman can, that word, James Bond, and not fall in love with him. I'm like, okay. Uh, and we also get Tiffany's rape backstory from the novel, um, but it's actually amped up somewhat. She was actually gang raped in the treatment of the story. And 
yeah it's ugh, it, it makes quite un- it made quite uncomfortable reading to be honest it's it's one of those things like it, when you were singing there that it hit me where um and i i'm i'm on the fence overall with it but there's uh, obviously there's there's people on bond twitter and, and bond fandom in, in in general who are like should we bring more fleming elements into the you know i want fleming else and part of me thinks well which ones do you mean because that one yeah. read as a very fleming thing because the guy for better or worse often didn't pull his punches especially yeah. with female characters and yeah um some have aged better than others i know um especially with the spiral of me some people have issues with the female characters in in that and i and i i think overall it's probably one of the more developed female characters felt mm-hmm. Fleming more. but then again you think how much sensitivity would think these things have been dealt with in the Bond films, in in the Eon films, and um, again with the tone, especially. I know obviously this is clearly going with a much more serious tone, kind of like Majesties, but the overall, it's like is is you know implied or possibly even explicit gang rape, the sort of thing you would expect in a in a Bond film. Like I don't, yeah. I don't know. It's like again, it's very Fleming, but maybe it's one of those things again. Just could they have dealt with that? tactfully and you know because it's yeah. not the sort of thing i think you can just sort of mention as an offhand comment um you know it's got to affect her character deep i suppose i suppose to be fair to me about me just try this like there's a whole i think maybe the third treatment there's like a whole paragraph or two delving into her um psyche and how she's affected by it but again it, it kind of boils down to she she can't love anybody because yeah. and it's like that's a bit of a simplistic reading of somebody who's been gang raped and it's it's again maybe it's better that they moved away from that in the in the yeah in the i mean film. i mean just to go back to what he said about the the feedback on the mankovitz script that maybam gave um he 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 recognized that mankovitz's version was far more uh, of a fantasy Mm. Um, so he even points out the story tends towards too much kidding itself at times so there was very much a conscious desire to lighten up the script and I know there are still in Diamonds more problematic elements than in any of the Bond film mm. but it's, it, if you consider the what some of the, the stuff that we have in these early treatments it would be really interesting to see if those did make their way to screen how how they might have influenced the Bond series going forward. I think we probably did need to lighten things up Definitely after our majesties. I mean, people complain, rightly so, about the uh, You Won't Live Twice <laughs> turning Japanese scene. And it's like, yeah. the vibe I get from reading some of these treatments is like, we ain't seen nothing yet. You know, you, we could, it could have been a lot worse with some of the things. I mean, the one that stood out to me was that we have um, a Oxford-educated um, uh um, field agent, um, a bit like Cameron Shaw in The Living Daylights, you know, someone who's one of the one of the locals, but turns out to be someone who's been westernized, mm-hmm. which is a trope that you do get several times through the Bond series. Actually, as soon as you find out, like Countess Liesel in uh, For Your Eyes Only, as well, as soon as you find out she's from the north of England, with a re- I'm aware that I'm talking to someone here from the north of England with one of the re- re- dodgiest accents you could possibly have. But it, it's almost like the audience is supposed to relax at that point and go, Oh, she's one of us. Um, but this guy is described as, and I quote from the screenplay here, a brown skinned David McCallum. We're, so David McCallum was um, the Ilya Kuryakin character in uh, the the Man from Uncle TV series, um, and uh, I mean, when I first read that, I was like, "Oh my God, we're not going to go down the route of brown face in Bond, are we?" Yeah, <laughs> but I think not. the I, I think the idea was to get an actor who looked a bit like David mm. McCallum, but happened to have brown skin. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh God! One would hope. Um, again, as you say, it's something that again struck me. It's it's such a a Flemingism, and as you say, it was used again and again in the in the films of the the the, the foreigner. Yeah. But like you say, he's okay because he's been to Eton, mm-hmm. you know, or he's or he's been to Cambridge, or both. In the case of uh, the guy in, in in these treatments, which is you know obviously just like the epitome of Westernization. You know, he's, he's he's like the ultra. He's like Bond, I guess. Who kind of I know never went to Eton, as far as I can remember. They never mentioned him going to Eton in the but we went to Cambridge um, on screen. You know from uh, you only have twice, um, and I wonder. <laughs> I just wonder about that one. It's an interesting one because it's a very again like it's a very Mayborn 
uh, ism as well of the the foreigner who's been westernized and it's just it's usually i think it's it's okay um it it, it doesn't but it's not one of those things that makes me for better or worse overly uncomfortable um because it's usually not it's not horribly offensive but it's 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 not great and it's it's like why why must they always insist that he's a bit dodgy until you find out he's went to Oxford. You know, like that's because that to me that comes over much more on the treatment than it necessarily would on screen, if you know yeah, what I mean. Like 100 percent Um like Living Daylights, for example. You know, you know, Bond Bond's helping uh the Mujahideen before he finds out their leader went to Oxford. I can't remember whether he went to Oxford or Cambridge, but he, he's obviously he's been westernized. Yeah. Um so it's not but it's not like we get this thing of like, oh, you know, should I be aware of this guy? Which I feel you may have got here yeah. um really that's just in the third that's just in the third treatment when he's in india um the other two we get <laughs> a whole host of other interesting um eastern China characters uh yeah. yeah um one thing actually to double back a bit when i'm looking at the notes the continuity we've, we've talked about a bit uh another mayhemism is he was obsessed with blofeld being in a neck brace the man yes. is absolutely utterly obsessed with it. Yeah. Um, to the extent that it appears in every treatment. Um, and every treatment going forward after this as well, all the way through, mm. he was obsessed with the idea, which is an interesting continuity link to uh Majesty's obviously yeah. where he's in the neck brace at the end of that film. Um, but we get him uh apparently he always he always rips it off with a with a flourish at the end before engaging Bond in a in a fist fight. Proving that actually he's been fine the whole time. He didn't need the neck brace. It was all for sure. For what show, I don't know. He never elaborates as to why he would be doing this. Um, doesn't say whether it would be Tally Savalas for President Will, but I suppose no. you could imagine it being. Um Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I can't imagine Charles Gray doing some of the things in these treatments, to be honest. <laughs> Although having said that, you know, and we'll we we've I'm sure we've got other things to talk about, but means we're talking about Blofeld. The way Blofeld dies in these treatments is actually brilliant. Um, I mean, I, I just can't imagine it on screen. I mean, the second one is a bit more realistic. Mm. So the second one, Blofeld's killed by a tiger, which the screenplay says is poetic irony. It's mm. not quite because he likes cats. So it's, <laughs> but it's not quite clear how the audience are gonna be made to feel that it's poetic irony. Mm. Um, so in the third treatment, he doubles down on this. And <laughs> <laughs> this is by far my favourite part of any of these treatments. When I read them, I had to message you this. I was just like, I can't believe I've just typed this um, in my notes. So in the third treatment, um, after actually Maybaum was sort of losing interest in some of this, because he writes in the treatment, <laughs> I don't at the moment know how Bond escapes. So it's just like, we'll, we'll fill that in later. One thing he was really interested in is being able to program kittens to attack people. So somehow <laughs> Bond <laughs> figures out how to control this bunch of cute white kittens and six them on Blofeld and they kill Blofeld. So just imagine but if people, you know, people say that what we get in Diamonds of Forever is outlandish and silly. Just imagine a bunch of really cute white kittens leaping on Blofeld, tearing his throat out or whatever. And I'm just like, <laughs> wow. So it's not only that, we get that <laughs> after hours of deep introspection on the previous film and Bond's feelings about his dead wife which are resolved by him throwing Blofeld to be torn to death by a bunch of white kittens. I love it. It's, just, it's, it's, it's the sort of, like I say, just total tonal derangement you get yeah. from these mobile things. Like, like it, it feels like he's read an article somewhere about people training cats. And he's like, <laughs> yes, that's how we need to kill Blofeld. It's, oh, it's perfect. It's so obvious. He loves cats. You know, like, it's... I just don't get it. I mean, even if you look past this at the later ones, it, 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 I mean, Blofeld gets killed by a variety of animals in these dreams. There's there's the tiger in the first one, there's the cats yeah. in the third one. He's moved on to sharks um, right, okay. later on because we get almost a proto-Stromberg like yeah, escape pod thing um, where 
there's Bond and Tiffany in it, and then they find <laughs> it's like I'm like, how can you shoot this and it's not unintentionally hilarious? Bond and Tiffany are in this little escape pod, and they find out also Wind Kid and Blofeld are in there. <laughs> it's like okay, so then there's this whole like protracted fight where he throws Wind and Kid and then Blofeld out of the window without water coming. Out. I don't know how this would work to be eaten by sharks. Then he also had this little asterisk saying. Oh, well, don't worry about Blofeld. We can just have loads of blood in the water and like the floating neck brace. Don't show the body so we can bring him back later. And it's like, what? <laughs> it's so wow. bizarre. It's so weird. And yeah, this... this is also the man who said, and again, more notes on the Mankiewicz script. Um, the, uh, the Basically, the story isn't logical. Well, yeah, we know <laughs> that. And that survives to the final film. Things like, how does Tiffany know about Blofeld's cat? Mm. I'm just like, yeah, we've always, we've always, well, many of us have always pondered this in Diamonds Rower. And it seems to me, and you you said in one of the messages to me, it's like, they almost like took these notes and were just like, yeah, we don't care. (laughs) (laughs) We know, we know this doesn't make any sense, but we don't care. The guy mentioned it before they even filmed it. Like they think this is a continuity error and just nobody seemed to care. They just filmed it anyway, which I kind of love. I mean, I kind of just like, you know, it's good. Because if you're going to do it with any film, I guess, you know, that's our fair, right? I mean, like I, to be honest, I have to hold my hands up and say, until I saw this pointed out a few years ago, it never bothered me as to why oh, it really? didn't recognize. Yeah, because I, by that point in the film, I'm just going with it. Like I don't, like whatever happens, happens. I'm having a great time. Like I just don't mind. But it's interesting that he was like, yeah, like, how does Tiffany know about the cat? You know, and um, like he says, <laughs> Bond never sees Winton Kid in the entire picture. Seems odd. I was like, well, why? Why does he see what? They're going to kill him. Like, they're assassins. Like, they're not going to. Yeah, it, like, works. Kid. it works in the finished film because it then works, it's the yeah. whole smells a rat thing. It's so clever, I think. Yeah. I mean, the um, it's very tangent, but they, they kind of go off on that um, even as late as the the shooting script they're still going with the um the novel ending which i guess we can talk about a bit because they go with that in the treatments mm. as well where um well it's kind of a hybrid because Wynton and kid are coming as waiters serving the meal but then they say they, they distract bond to get him out of the room and say there's a call for you from yeah. Bullet White, uh and he goes out up to find there's no call in which point they try to kill tiffany with boiling oil <laughs> but then Bond comes back in and defeats them um, but we we get that in all three treatments where it's much more like the um, the end of the novel where um, Tiffany is trapped with Winton Kid yeah, and Bond yeah. sort of abseils around the outside of the ship and goes through the portal which I I kind of like but then I've always said like one of my favourite ever like if, I, if, I'm, if I'm people are saying like what's the most James Bond moment I love that he susses out that they're not waiters because they don't know what claret is. But yeah. I've also said, like, how many innocent American waiters has he killed in this manner? Because to them, it's Bordeaux, right? They wouldn't know it's claret. He just, like, offs every guy. Like, Ross Shields claret. is a claret. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's um... like, and they're Americans. So, like, they logically wouldn't know. But he just, like, that's... But, I mean, I, I there's obviously the after and everything else. I mean, I, I kind of... That whole sequence where he susses them out, I think, is kind of great. And this wouldn't amazing, work if you'd yeah. seen them early in the film because you'd recognise them. Know. But... You know, it's like I love a bit of logical deduction from from Bond. Yeah. He's like puts piece things together. Yeah. Um, I it was the was the cats thing the kind of most mad thing for you in this, or is um, are there any other deranged bits which you think, wow? Yeah. It's it's. Do I only have to pick one? Um, oh, you can have <laughs> you can have a couple. There's, I mean, the whole, the whole thing, to me, had this like slight. Bond uncanny valley vibe to it, you know, where it was like as you say, there's the there's the Blofeld getting hit by cats, there's Blofeld wearing the neck brace, which he tears off like a wild animal he's described, and it's it's so odd. There's uh, even in the in the pre-titles bit where as we've said, there's this whole thing of Bond being very melancholic. He's walking a dog on a moor, we yeah. see a picture of Tracy, we hear we have all the time in the world, and then Maypom says a very voluptuous skydiver drops out of the, you know, and, and it's just like, it's such a tonal ship. Like, is where that is Sandra? Uh, yeah. Um, no, that's Tiffany in the first. Oh, two. okay, it's Tiffany, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think he wasn't sure oh, how that's to it, yeah. use Tiffany at first. Like, sort of, in the first mm. two, um, 
treatments she's she's introduced like in the pre-tales she, she's very early on she just drops out the sky that's it and um he she he's seen bond talk for a bit and then bond sees her bond then you have the whole chasing to that but it's just it's so it, it, the whole thing seems weird like i also made a note saying there's a, a bit in the second treatment where um after getting the diamonds evaluated or not and you start the whole um pipeline off to barcelona Bond uh, follows Tiffany to a restaurant and sits down with her and they have this sort of conversation where he's kind of like implying that he's on her and knows what she's doing and he fakes being drunk and that seems like such like a Roger, like a like a mid like, like I could see Roger doing that. George Lazenby less so, right? Like even Connery less so. Like it's it's such like almost like like how can you play that in a way that isn't slapstick? You know, like it's yeah. it's gotta be funny because just it would seem it would seem weird if he was just like playing that straight, like oh I'm drunk and but and then goes off and makes a call to to MI6 and turns out he's sober the whole time and he knows exactly mm-hmm. what's been going on. Mm-hmm. Um but the whole see, as I say, the whole vibe I got was just weird. I mean, the third treatment is all over the place. That is I mean, I, I should say I, I rank them because the 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 four that they came in was all like all over the shop, and this is yeah. my logical um placement even though the third one is in many ways totally different from the other yeah, two it is, yeah he, he straight up he says in the second one this is the second treatment and mentions certain points that are like as quote unquote like the first treatment which can only refer to what i think are the first and so maybe this the third one was like a preliminary treatment i'm not sure yeah, so okay. i've got it's either the first or the third either way this whole you know the whole sequel plot point was dropped after this so yeah i guess the order doesn't hugely matter but um in the in the third one it just it, it i the, the the feeling i got was like um the goldfinger novel where it's a bit all over the place and bonds working with the enemy and then the suss yeah. out so he goes then he goes back and it's just there's so many double and triple crosses um again later i got you got used bond joins specter like um the john god novel uh role of honor he joins Spe- like, like why why does he join Spectre? But then um there's that whole bit where double and six and double weight try and kill him, and that's what Spectre like, oh well, I guess he's you know again that's get a bit like license to kill, I guess, yeah. where you know yeah. he's they think he's being kicked out of MI6, so he's willing to join Spectre, but his whole plan is that he and this other Spectre agent will join forces and overthrow Blowfield. <laughs> it's just it's so weird. It's such an odd like, like it maybe might work in a novel, like Fleming's Goldfinger. Would it work on screen? Would it be a lot of just dialogue and flip flopping, backtracking? Oh, now he's a double agent. Now he's not. I don't. I just don't know. It, it, it Do you wonder? Very... I wonder how much of this was a consequence of not knowing certain. Probably by the third treatment stage, who was going to be Bond? Did they mm. definitely? And there's a note in the in the third treatment. To, um, no, it's the notes on the Mankiewicz script. He says the real Bond is back. Yeah, there was definitely yeah. an acknowledgement that Sean Connery was cast by that point. Mm. But I think they were. I think for me, these treatments are kind of. And this might be wrong, but it's almost like they are assuming George Lazenby, and yeah. then they're less certain. And so, this is when the crazy ideas come mm. in. And I think, <laughs> as often as happened throughout Bond, they've had to reinvent him. And it's like the third treat. I'm glad you said that about the third treat. But the third treat for me is the one which I made the most notes on. Yeah. Because it's like the anything goes script, including <laughs> the attack kittens. You know, I never thought I'd get to write in my notes, white cats tear Blowfield to pieces on Bond's command. That, mm. I mean, for me, that is what this third treatment is all, all about. It's just got all of these ingredients. And it's so long, that treatment. Yeah. That would make like a four-hour movie. It moves through so many different locations. It's got all of these elements to it. Um, yeah, and I think they were probably um, in a in a space which was very liminal. I know I overuse that word, but very <laughs> everything was kind of uncertain and not pinned mm-hmm. down. But at the same time, it's really interesting how many of those ingredients we then I, I, we haven't even gone through the fact that there's a python yeah. attack in there which the appears python, yeah. in moonraker you get the taj mahal which we get a shot of in octopussy uh bonds back to using a beretta for some reason <laughs> instead of a wolfer there's so many things in that third treatment which are noteworthy yeah, yeah. um and i think it was kind of like probably a time where they really did think anything goes mm. and some of it would have some of it would have just been bizarre had it made its way onto the screen. 
with the um with the Python sequence that you're mentioning there, this, this is probably me again is reading Wayne Witch anyway. I'm not going to imply for one moment that this was a direct lift, but I got the, uh, reminded of the bit in Skyfall, you know, where he gets thrown into the Komodo dragon pit. Yeah. Because the whole sequence is this goon, this, like, it's a snake farm, not like a casino or anything like that, like in Skyfall, but yeah, um, yeah. this goon throws Bond into a snake pit and Bond escapes and throws the guy in and then he gets killed by the snake. And I get... Mm. That, that's the sort of thing I like reminds me a bit of mm. Skyfall where they both fall into the Komodo dragon pit. And mm. it's just funny how you get these common ideas, you know, like yeah. reused. Like whether it's like as you see, I think a lot of them are deliberate. I don't doubt for one moment that I think when certain writers, I think Purvis and Wade maybe certainly did this because there's far too many, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I think it's a very good thing to go through the archives of scripts and treatments that yeah. they have yeah, and look through and see what hasn't been used, what's a good idea, or let's lift that and, and you know, read to and use it in our film. I think that's maybe a bit of a stretch to think of the, the Python thing, but there's so many of them. Yeah. Um, it's, and I, I'm very much a fan of it because there's a lot of good ideas that just, I got to say about the double O agent that just haven't been mm. used yet. Mm. Um, well, you never know. Some of these things... I, I'm holding out for the attack kittens. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, you can go down the bookies and you can put a bet on who the next Bond is. I don't, I don't know what the odds would be on, uh, on them on having attack kittens in Bond twenty six. I think, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think I'll be getting a, any return on my, uh, on my bet if I put that one on. But some of these things, you never know, they might crop up. I kind of, like I said, I hope so because I mean, I've, um. I've mentioned this on Twitter again before about the opening to Live and Let Die is my absolute favourite unused idea. I don't know if you've, mm. if you've seen uh, what I've said about it because I, I, I think, think I just you did it. tell me about it. Yeah, um, out to like the 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 sort of the the, the short version is. Um, I mean, I know a lot of people say, and I'm one of them. Like. Roger maybe has the most disappointing introduction of any Bond. Like, yeah. it's just there. Like, all the other ones kind of get some sort of moment mm. um, where, you know, like, either it's a cool shot, like, with Dalton or Connery or, yeah, I guess even, you know, Lazenby gets, you know, the the I'm, you know, Bond, yeah, James yeah. Bond is the opening line. Roger is me. He's just, like, there in a bed with a woman. And I guess it's it's okay. But um, in, the, in the Live and Let Die original script which apparently I, i've done a lot of research on this i was really hoping they'd shot it and apparently they didn't it was it was a last minute cut mm. and because it's in the shooting script and i was like logically they maybe have shot this because he's in rome and he's meeting these two uh henchmen and there's some sort of thing being arranged where he's going to buy these documents and it's on a rooftop in in rome which you don't know is a rooftop at the start but he uh randomly just knocks out or shoots it's I'm un it's unclear which one of the henchmen the other ones saying you know uh oh we said there was, there was no weapons and then bond emerges from the shadows and says you know you said you'd come alone and says you know who am i told you i'm mr bond i'm oh, sorry he doesn't it's off screen when he says that um you said you'd come alone and then he emerges from the shadows and says bond james bond and, like that was such a great roger like in that film yeah, especially that, I think that really, could have worked really really well um and so I'm I'm very much in favor of of later writers going back and mining these ideas because that could be that could work to me. I think with minimal retooling, yeah, that yeah. could work as an introduction in the next film because it's it's not an oldish, you know, like an, an old idea. It really could work. Um I, I'm there's this <laughs> outside the I would say there's there's a few, the elephant roundup maybe, um maybe wouldn't fly <laughs> in another film. Maybe the kittens. I don't know. I think it depends what angle we go with. Maybe the kittens could work. Depends what tone they go with. Mind. If they I'm go sorry? with something, if it depends what tone they go with. Mm. Do you think we could do lightening up a little bit? Do you think uh, this is sort of the similar point um, that they were at? It's like, oh God, how do we follow on a Majesties? You know, mm. we started, we ended on a downer. Do we? And I think, I think probably they made the right call, but I know lots yeah, of people would disagree with me that they went the other way. I know this is a thing where a lot of people, um, again, I see on, on Bond Twitter, it's like, it's that's why this was really interesting to me because one of the, you see it over and over again where people make some great like fan art of the posters and things yeah, about yeah. If, what if George Lazenby was in Diamonds? And it turns out I'm like, I'm really glad he wasn't in Diamonds. I mean, I love I loved the Diamonds that we got. I really like one yeah. of that's, I, I'm really pleased that that's 
I mean, I know. I think I think a lot of them are getting a, a reappraisal. Maybe people just they, they, everyone has their own favorite for a reason. They're putting it forward. I've always kind of loved diamonds. I'm really pleased that it's people are starting to you know your you your good self. One of the main proponents of that. I'm so pleased that that's getting more love. I thought um, of rebranding licensed queer as a diamonds are forever fan site. To be honest, <laughs> I wouldn't be against it. I mean, it may be limit you be limited to things like this, like talking about the kittens. But you know, I suppose. But overall, I'm kind of pleased that we got what we got. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't trade it. This is the, I mean, the, the only thing is, I guess you just look at treatments. I know it's it's limited. Maybe in an alternate universe, if we'd got this version, and I read a treatment for the you know the Magnavitz yeah. Charles Gray version, I'd be like, oh, thank God we didn't get that. That doesn't mm -hmm. seem to work at all. But you no, know, it's just because what I'm used to. Yeah. But I mean, I, I think people who maybe read a lot of what I say and know that I'm more of a light Bond fan overall. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I I've enjoyed the like, I mean, I love Casino Royale. You know, I, I I've I've enjoyed. I feel I'm in that. I'm such a weird, like, uncategorizable Bond fan in that I prefer light films, yet other than No Time to Die, which I wasn't a fan of, I enjoyed all of the Craig films. But other people are like, I, other people are like, you know, they enjoy it alternately, you know, they liked Casino Royale, they liked Skyfall, and they liked No Time to Die. But, I mean, I enjoyed, for one, because I can usually get something, I'm sure even with No Time to Die, I'll get, I'll enjoy that eventually. I can usually get something from all of them. But overall, yeah. I would say I like a lighter tone. And, yeah. um hopefully i mean i've got i'm not <laughs> i've not been positive about it because i get the feeling that the production team want to maybe carry on the break tone for better or worse i'm not against it you know like i mean i'm sure they'll do what they think is best excuse me but if i was able to pick i would definitely go with a with a lighter yeah tone overall because you know i'm i'm a i'm a brosnan kid it's what i was brought up on i yeah. i want same you know, because it's something where I've always thought like it's a an oldish franchise. It's probably one of the, if not, it's depending on how you calculate these things. Yeah. You know, obviously you've got Sherlock Holmes and that sort of thing, but it's sort of like a a continually running franchise. I would say it's kind of only you know got Doctor Who is is competition, yeah. um, and then it's maybe like Star Trek just came. I mean, they they've had their hiatuses, um, and people that are being so old, I think you need to have a bit every now and then. We try and get some younger people interested in it. One hundred percent. I mean, I obviously I don't know. I'm just theorizing, but part of me thinks like if I was growing up, would I have been into the Craig films? Yeah. As much as I was into the Brosnan films, because I mean, you had it was very much a. I mean, whether whether the films were kid friendly, jury's out. But the whole the wider marketing with the you know the magazines and the video games, everything else, it was all kind of seemed geared towards getting a younger audience on board, and I feel. After two decades, maybe now is the time to try doing that again because I know you've got a lot of competition with Marvel and that sort of thing. Mm. But you, you know, the the fan, it's going to die out eventually with with people. You don't get more people interested. Totally, I've been saying this for years myself. Mm. They really do need to think about what a younger audience wants. Although, having said that, I know quite a few younger people in my day job who really like the Daniel Craig films, mm. but um, and perhaps it's just because that's what they associate with Bond. Yeah. Uh, but then they also like A View to a Kill and <laughs> you know, things that are less serious. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I want to have my cake and eat it. I want the serious <laughs> and the silly, ideally in the same film, which is, I think, what we kind of get in Diamonds, obviously more verging on silly sort of thing. There's no real psychological depth to anything going on. But... Uh, it, it'd be interesting to see if we do get some of uh, some of uh, some of these things coming back up into um, into Bond Twenty Six. So, if people are, obviously you post an awful lot about not just about diamonds, but also you know you've accessed so many much of this material uh, mm -hmm. online. If people want to find you online, where's the best places to find you, Tom? It's, it's on Twitter, and if this. <laughs> I think I'm Tom S Mason ninety one on Twitter. I'm going to double check yeah, because we want to tell people. Yeah, I mean, check. when this goes out, I'll obviously tag you in it. Um, but it's uh, like the ultimate, you know, I I don't ever have to give up my own phone number because I never call myself. I think is that what Hank Scorpio said in um. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I never yeah, call yeah. my own office. Like I, I've never, <laughs> I never looked myself on Twitter. But yeah, that's currently the best place. I'm. I keep sort of um. Pondering whether to have a longer blog site and whether people would care about it because I know um a lot of like you you do such good work I think overall with like 
getting doing deep dives on Bond films. I you know I I like what more can I really say? Um, it's so. That's maybe I might leave that to, to you, the long form sort of okay. analysis of the film. Right? Well, I mean, to be the, the, the some of the like the some of the best that I've I've read as far as I mean, I get it. I mean, it seems like every time I read another one, I don't like go too fun like Panjerica this, but like the the appreciation I often get for these films and with bits like strands you pull out that I've never oh, thought of, uh, which is why like I was like I have to show you these these treatments yeah. because I'm usually, like appreciate and get some i think there's more articles on diamonds forever than anything else on the website so <laughs> yeah. this is this is another valuable contribution to the literature we'll keep we'll keep plugging that gap in the literature tom at some point i think we should um we should talk more about some of the other yeah definitely the Joker, because there are yeah. some um the two that stick out in my mind are the spy who loved me and the man with the golden gun yeah, uh, I won't. I won't spoil you on them. But okay. Them so a preview of coming attractions. Hopefully. Uh, yeah, we're looking forward to it. 